So good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday morning session from Arizona Bioscience Week on investment activity in the era of COVID-19. Um, this will be an interactive discussion, so I hope that um, you will join into the discussion as we share. Do keep in mind this session is being recorded, so please do not share anything that should not be shared on the internet. Um, as we get started, I want to thank all of our sponsors for Arizona Week, Arizona Bioscience Week, including the Flynn Foundation, um, who has been very active in our bioscience entrepreneurial community and is a sponsor of all of this week's activities. So when we talk about COVID-19, um, we've seen massive changes in the economy. We have seen changes across the um, science universe, we have seen changes to all of our lives. We've also seen a somewhat unexpected change in the level of venture capital funding that has been taking place um, during the first half of 2020. Um, and as you can see on the slide here, which is sourced out of PitchBook, um, basically we've seen an escalating level of venture capital investment that's been driven by a number of different factors, actually going back to 2017. So um, we, we had the very difficult time during the recession, which is prior to this 10 year period. Um, and then from 2010 through to 2020, you can see how investment in biopharma venture capital has increased. When you look at um, med, full, the full med tech, this is not disrepresentative as far as the trend curve, is concerned. Um, however, um, the predominance of the investment has been over time in the biopharma sector. So one question would be, what is driving that? And what is driving that is increased interest from the investment community on new products, new cures, new treatments that are impacting major diseases primarily in the blockbuster range. So what you see are people who are, um, you know, making advances in oncolytic viruses for cancer, people who are making advances on large population diseases, people who are making advances in um, diagnostic tests that have massive, massive opportunities um, for expansion, you know, companies like Exact Sciences. And um, very interestingly, we're seeing um, a real interest right now in AI-enabled technologies. Um, and we've seen that recently with uh, one of our um, previous White Hat presenting companies who um, you know, recently closed a strategic round with Bayer in excess of $200 million. So as we continue to move forward, the question is, how is this going to play out? Because we're at the beginning of the decade, not at the end of it. So one of the things that we are really looking at as we start to um, develop models around venture capital, IPO, and follow on um, public offerings is what does the market for capital look like at least quarterly in this last 10 years and how will that impact the market going forward? I'd like to credit um, Bruce Booth at Atlas Ventures. Um, many of you probably follow him at Life Science VC. This is Bruce's chart, um, but it takes a look at these exact parameters. Um, you know, what was the level of venture capital funding in the blue? How did the IPOs follow that funding? Um, in the orange, and then the follow-on IPOs, those additional raises of capital um, that companies have gone out for after their initial public offering. And we are seeing that more and more um, in the bioscience sector where companies do their initial IPO, um, raise a chunk of money, continue to progress towards milestones, and as they're moving into commercialization, prior to being acquired by either private equity or a strategic partner, um, it's not uncommon to see a follow-on IPO. And those follow-on IPOs tend to be much bigger chunks 
because the company is much further along. So you can kind of see what the trend has been at different times. Now, the key issue is what does that mean to our earlier stage companies as we start looking at taking our life science innovations through the development cycle and into the delivery cycle? What are the pieces that everyone is going to be looking at? One of the things that is um, significantly different now than it has been in the past is the way that the private markets and the government programs have been working in alignment, especially on, on project re projects relative to um, COVID-19 response. But we are hoping that this is establishing a new paradigm of ways that government and industry at all levels can work together um, to bring some of these truly life-changing or life-saving innovations uh, to market in, in the near future. So there are discussions ongoing um, with the highest levels of the current government. There are discussions ongoing with um, presidential candidates as far as how do we take this innovation, this collaboration, that is currently underway and systematize it so that it can move additional innovation forward, not just for COVID-19, but for a wide range of health challenges and diseases. So when we look at the life science investing ecosystem, and we're gonna spend quite a bit of time on this last slide, um, I really want to, you know, make this more interactive, have this the opportunity for some of you to ask questions. But we're really going to look at, um, from the perspective of our earlier stage companies, what is that pathway that they're following? And how is the money available or not available now? And how do we see that potentially changing as we move into um, the last half? or the last quarter of 2020 and start looking at 2021, 2022 and beyond and some of the opportunities and quite frankly challenges um, that, that we are dealing with as risk factors or unknowns right now. So we'll take a, uh, have a brief discussion relative to angels and non-dilutive financing. Um, chat briefly about family offices, although you'll have an opportunity to learn more about that um, later this week. Um, please do check your schedules and we will be sending out an announcement um, due to the death in the family of one of our panelists um, that the time of the family office panel will be moved. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about the venture capitalists and you'll have an opportunity on Wednesday um, to hear from some of our venture capitalists um, on that VC panel. Um, Please again, check your schedule. And then we'll talk a little bit about the role of private equity and the very interesting role that we anticipate seeing with strategics. So um, briefly, as I said, we're going to follow this um, paradigm and look at the life science ecosystem uh, from the perspective of our family offices, our angels, our non-dilutive capital, our venture capitalists, our private equity and others. Um, and so the first thing that I wanted to um, really focus on is some of the changes that we're seeing in the angel environment right now. Um, there is a great deal of interest across the angel um, investment community. They're seeing high levels of engagement on educational sessions, attending conferences like this one, um, attending, attending venture days, things of that nature. However, what we are seeing with the, um, especially in the life science angel community, is that um, a lot of those investment dollars are going to support their current investments. Um, and the reason for that is pretty simple. Clinical trials are slowing down because of the um, challenges of getting things coordinated, getting patients um, actively engaged or participating during this particular time. We're also seeing that um, the angels who, again, these are you know, higher, high net worth individuals 
who in many cases have worked for a long time during their careers um, to assess the wealth that they use for their angel investing and very often have that in the private market. We've seen instability in the private markets because of COVID-19 and because of the election. Um, the markets do not like uncertainty. And right now, there is a good deal of uncertainty. This election season is probably the most unpredictable of any that we've seen in recent memory. Um, and as we found out in 2016, the polls are not always correct. So there is a lot of discussion right now and within the investor community on you know, where things are going. That reflects in the public markets, that impacts the holdings of angel investors and it is slowing down um, their ability to pull the trigger on deals. So we are seeing that right now, and we hope that after the election, as things stabilize, we will start to see um, that that starts to work through um, once again. Interestingly, when it comes to non-diluted capital, which is the second area where our early stage companies get the lion's share of their funding, so here we're talking about philanthropic partners, um, foundations that do either strategic investing or grant making, um, the federal government who is net, which is now um, you know, putting non-diluted capital into certain companies in certain areas at a higher level than they ever have before, um, and other non-dilutive opportunities sometimes involved in um, strategic partnerships or other areas. So when we start to look at those, what we're seeing is that for targeted applications in the non-diluted space, we are seeing an influx of capital to try and balance out the, the changes in the capital markets or to address very specific initiatives that are important to either that nonprofit or the government. We're seeing that um, with disease foundations who are um, at this particular time, you know, looking very strategically at how they can invest um, on behalf of the diseases that they are looking for treatments and cures for. We're also seeing that the level of investment um, that is coming out of the federal government for targeted programs um, is higher than ever before. And interestingly, because people are distracted by COVID, um, some of those dollars it's, it's le are less competitive now than they have been in the past. Um, a good example is um, the National Institute on Aging, um, who that received at the NIH that received additional funds um, within the federal budget to address dementia and Alzheimer's disease and issues resolve, uh, revolving around um, other neuro, um, neurological diseases, aging in place for our seniors, and many of the other um, factors that are involved in aging. What um, they are doing now is adding new and additional challenges that um, life science innovators can answer the call to. We're seeing the same thing with the largest part of the NIH, which is the National Cancer Institute. Um, again, the National Cancer Institute has multiple um, applications open right now, and we anticipate um, that that is going to continue. So it's very, very important. You know, we're coming through the end of the September cycle, but we're going to open, the next cycle will open with the new fiscal year. It is very, very important that you get um, on those mailing lists, on um, the email list for each agency that could potentially impact your company and apply for those grants. That non-dilutive capital is there and it is available. Interestingly, one of the programs that we see underutilized um, in Arizona and quite frankly across the Rocky Mountain region is the STTR program where industry and university are partnering together on a particular project. Those can be very, very advantageous for our smaller companies because the universities have certain resources um, that you may not have at your disposal. That allows your grant to be leveraged with those resources 
and very often um, is looked upon very favorably by the agencies. It's also an opportunity to work with your tech transfer offices to look at what resources or discoveries are already sitting in the tech transfer office um, that are ready to be deployed and can be used and can use the STTR platform to do so in addition to the SBIR funding that is available. So when you're looking at that non-dilutive capital, looking at what the government is doing is really important. It's really interesting that, um, you know, according to Gallup last year, there were, um, they rank all of the different industries and what's important to those industries um, from a public opinion perspective. In 2019, um, the absolute bottom of the barrel, the very least popular of all industries, was the biopharma industry. Number two was the hospitals. And number three from the bottom was Congress. Now, with the advent of COVID-19 and the response that you know those three um, segments coming together have been working on, um, the numbers are coming up a little. We're not bottom anymore. Um, but we really have a challenge with the general public in their perception of the value that we create. And until we address some of the challenges that we face, it is very, very difficult to look at um, how we're going to grow this industry and how we are going to proceed with science and investment if we don't address the public opinion issues. So one of the reasons that we have things like Arizona Bioscience Week, one of the reasons that there is now a 56-page publication in the AZ Business Magazine, which is going out um, in the, is in the mail to 25,000 business leaders online here in Arizona, uh, many of which are potentially angel investors, and it's also available online combined with celebrating life and science, the one hour television special that will air tomorrow night on CW61 at 7 p.m. or on YouTube slash AZ Bio One for those of you outside the Phoenix viewing area, is to raise the awareness of the work that is being done in this industry to benefit the people around us because we are a lot different than a ride sharing app. We are a lot different than autonomous vehicles. But at the same time, we want to make sure that um, we are getting that taken care of. And by the way, callers, if you have not muted your line, would you please do so? Um, so as we are moving forward, those are key issues that we want to be sensitive to and be aware of. When we look at the venture capital community, as I showed you on the slide before, um, we're seeing a very interesting paradigm where we, during the 2006, 2008 period, where venture capital um, money going into new funds was not good. Um, and we saw that um, you know, deployment of funds stretched out as companies struggled. Um, it's very different this time. We've seen more money going into existing venture capital organizations um, with the launch of new funds um, that we've seen in a decade. Okay, there's been a tremendous influx of funding into venture capital. And that brings us to a, a real interesting outlook as we start to progress into this new decade which is that they have timelines and they have to deploy capital. So when we're looking at where they're going to deploy, um, that will be an education process to really make sure that we are you know, front and center in, in working those relationships. It's also gonna be a bit of a challenge, specifically because we have um, less opportunities to meet with venture capitalists face-to-face 
um, during this particular pandemic. And many of you may have seen that the biggest face-to-face -face connection meeting of the year um, that was planned for 2021, the JP Morgan Healthcare Week in San Francisco, um, did announce um, that they last week that that will be going virtual. So those tens of thousands of meetings that were taking place all over San Francisco, um, the week that second week in January, um, is going to have to be addressed in a different way. And I know um, from my conversations behind the scenes. Um, that Biotech Showcase is working on a solution to help with that particular challenge. For our earlier stage companies, that is the most par um, active partnering opportunity throughout the week. Um, we also know that Resi is working on a solution. Um, JPM, for their invited guests, will have a virtual solution, and I anticipate that there will be others. In addition, Bio will make its Bio partnering system which it has made available for the last couple of JPMs available. So get ready from Thanksgiving through Christmas. Um, you're going to be spending a lot of time reaching out to people and setting up meetings on partnering apps because it's just not safe yet for us all to meet face to face in those kind of numbers. So let's talk a little bit about private equity and strategics. Um, private equity is another area that is again um, attracting large amounts of capital right now. Instability in the private in the public markets tend to lead to um, increased investment into funds that are privately held so that they can strategically deploy and hopefully get better returns than they might get in an unstable public market. Because of that, we are seeing higher levels right now of private equity activity. Um, and for those of you that have been through that before, you know, private equity is a whole new world. Venture capital is designed to come into your business, help you grow your business, hopefully grow your business a lot, and exit the business so that they can then make a return on their LPs, their venture capital investors. In the case of private equity, we look at it a little differently. Your private equity is your um, long-term hold, right? They are looking for a longer growth um, trajectory on the company um, with the hope that they will then exit it to the public markets or through strategic acquisition um, with a better rate of return. But historically, um, and this varies a bit by private equity fund, private equity tends to be more patient capital um, than you would see in a venture capital environment. Um, private equity is also very often um, less forgiving. So, you know, if, if a company is not meeting or performing the way the private equity people want to see it perform, it's very, it's not unusual for them to um, you know, sell it off early, readjust their portfolio, or et cetera. So while pi private equity can bring in significant funding for a developing company, um, it also, you know, with all of these relationships comes with its risks, and um, it's critically important when you choose a private equity partner that their goals and alignments are well aligned with yours. So, um, one of the questions that um, has come in um, relative to the second chart that we showed um, relative to um, the spike in the, in the equity markets, and I'll see if I can bring that up for you again. So what you see here, as we talked about a little bit in the beginning of this session, is the a chart that was direct, was created actually by Bruce Booth of Atlas Ventures, um, utilizing um, venture capital data from PitchBook, IPO and FPO from BMO Capital Markets, and um, excludes some outlying um, systems. So. What you see here is, you know, some significant um, follow-on, um, and I think that's the, the spike that, 
the, the question was posed to um, activity in 20 from 2014 to 2016. So in 24 from in the period from 2014 to 2016, there were a number of um, in the biopharma um, area, a number of new technologies that were um, coming out with very, very high potential. The companies were already public. So when they went out for that development um, capital, that's where you see that those spikes. The other thing that that you're looking at is you know the the range of that um, during that period, and the highest point of that was almost twenty billion dollars. Um, included some very very high profile um, IPOs that actually took place in 2013 2014 when the markets were not performing as well. Those companies had very very good metrics and numbers as they were moving forward. Going on to the going on to the um, market, and then they uh, cashed in on that by doing a follow-on public offering. Now we have also seen, as we look at this slide, um, if you look at some of the the low points in um, the that that tailing end of 2016. One of the things that we saw with follow-on IPOs in 2016, 2017, and 2018 was that if you look back in 2010, 2011, the IPOs were a lot smaller. People were not pulling in the numbers that they're pulling in today. And those large IPOs are, are what drive these numbers up. It's not necessarily the number of IPOs, it's the size of the IPOs. So what we saw, if you look at 2010, 2011, 2012, the IPOs were slimmer and the actual um, dollars raised in the IPOs for the most part were lower. So once you've done an IPO, unless something dramatically changes, you can only do an IPO once. So your follow-on IPOs and what we've seen with these companies that are in now in the public art markets is that they are required to um, do a follow-on public offering if they want to try and get additional money. So a lot of times what you'll see with those follow-ons were people that had a, a smaller IPO followed by a much larger follow-on IPO. And that gives you the, the, that, that spike. We've also seen, and there are some public companies in Arizona that have gone through this, um, where they, um, they, they went out on their IPO, they hoped that you know their technology in their market um, you know would have matured sooner than it did and they needed to access more funding they're now a public company they don't fit in the venture paradigm anymore they now go out to the market on a public um, on a follow-on IPO and I can think of two Arizona companies um, that have deployed that particular strategy in the last five years so as we um, move back into that. The other thing that I want to discuss during this session, which I think is very, very important, um, is the role of strategics, because there are some very interesting things happening right now um, in the world of strategics that um, bears discussion. Now, as we've seen pretty much over the last decade, the level of um, early stage discovery and investment within the strategics, excluding what's going on with COVID-19, which is really an aberration, um, is really shifting towards um, working with universities, working with early stage companies, working with second stage companies to find promising technology and either in license, acquire, or strategically invest in it. It's a way for them to hedge their bets. It's also a way for them to focus their investment in clinical um, trials and clinical research on those things that have progressed far enough in the pipeline that they're going to need not only the reach for clinical trials, but the ongoing reach for FDA approval and ultimately um, reimbursement distribution um, to the patients. So, what that means is that as things have been changing and as patents are expiring on a number of um, key blockbusters, 
that we are going to see um, significant strategic investment. And I think that the level of collaboration that has started during COVID-19, you know, we have nine vaccines that are currently in some stage of clinical trials. Every single one of them has one or more significant strategic partners. And in some cases, on top of that, the federal government. So what has happened in this first six months of the year is we've been forced to develop as an industry new levels of collaboration um, that will allow for um, hopefully changes in both laws and also in structures so that some of the barriers that currently exist to collaboration will be reduced. They'll never go away, but potentially they can be re reduced. So as we start looking through this process, COVID-19 gives us an opportunity not only to learn about the science, but find new ways of doing things. Um, I hope that you'll take advantage of the wonderful programs that are being done by CPATH, the Critical Path Institute, um, this week. They will be available if you missed um, the, the one yesterday. Um, they will be available after Bioscience Week is over in the video chat. There'll be a special video page with past programs. We will also be putting the streaming links to these programs in your um, calendar. So if you go back to Monday, once those links are up, you'll be able to see sessions that you missed. So, so basically what we're starting to see is new levels of collaboration as information is being shared. Um, you know, great examples during COVID have been Pfizer opening up their libraries, Sanfi opening up their libraries, making sure that, you know, Johnson & Johnson ensuring that their production capacity can be combined with vaccines that are being developed so that their global reach allows us to get this to the world. When the need is great, we have found ways to work around what is necessary. What we need to do now is figure out ways to build that collaboration. Now, um, I do want to just take a moment um, at the end of this session to talk a little bit about how government's going to play in that because there have been some recent events that, that really do matter as far as the investing landscape is concerned. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the next phase. Um, any questions? Okay. With their, <laughs> thank you, David Larwood. Um, so with that, as, as we move forward, let's talk about government for a minute. So one of the largest um, influxes of investment into life sciences in the last decade was Asia. Um, the uh, levels of investment that were coming out of China, that were coming out of Taiwan, that were filtering into other markets in other world, in, in other um, regions, for instance, a lot of Chinese money went into the UK. Um, that had tremendous impact on innovation, and there are a lot of companies that have benefited from that Chinese investment in the last decade. From a government perspective, there has been a great deal of concern in China, or I'm sorry, in Congress. Um, and within the, Fed, the um, administration relative to investments that the United States has made into new technologies and the investments that um, are taken by those subsequent companies from, you know, external investors. And those external investors include um, you know, not just the Chinese, but also Eastern Europe, uh, India. Um, we've even had situations in the UK and Germany where because of the funding that is inside of a fund, even though it's resident in what you would consider a safe zone, um, that, that there, it can become problematic. So 
one of the things that is going to be very interesting, especially with the concerns that have been raised about where this particular virus originated and how the virus response was handled, um, depending on administration um, after in, in 2021, um, we are very likely to see um, that, that there will be even higher levels of um, review on where the company is going and what the terms are. Um, we have seen um, here in Arizona where, um, you know, Arizona-based companies, you know, were, um, you know, continuing to grow as they started their exit strategy. They actually had to divest of certain technologies or certain activities um, because the acquirer, the acquirer um, you know, was from a country that could not have that particular um, access to that particular technology. So one of the things that you really have to keep in mind as you are developing um, historically, we've done due diligence, the, the VCs and the private equity people do due diligence on us. It will be your responsibility as a company working with your attorneys to do due diligence on them. And really look at your portfolio. Where did your science come from? Where did your previous investment come from? What are the um, you know, previous licenses and other things you have? that may or may not be um, acceptable depending on how that, those investors play out. So it becomes very, very important. Um, additionally, as we look at um, you know, the impacts of both the federal government and the um, elections that are coming, um, we are going to see um, some very interesting shifts. So man, some of you may have seen over the weekend on Sunday, um, the administration um, issued two executive orders. The first executive order um, had extended most favored nations status to a number of medications relative to Medicare um, and Medicaid and then um, Less than an hour later, it was rescinded and a new um, executive order was issued that instructs um, CMS to establish a pilot program um, that, was, that would um, establish most favored nations um, classification to a number of the most commonly used drugs. Um, and it would basically set up a program where um, with these pilot programs, um, which they sometimes call demo programs. These programs are set up for a subset of states or markets, and then they experiment with them. Now, these changes are not going to go into effect immediately. It is unlikely that anything can happen before the election uh, because the demo program needs to be um, rolled out. It needs to be put up for public comment. And then um, after the public comment period, it needs to be implemented the likelihood that they'll be able to get that done before the end of the, the year um, is just not good. Um, depending on the outcome of the election, that obviously would have an impact. Um, if the current administration um, continues its term, you know, beginning in 2021, um, then it's very likely that we're going to continue to see, you know, programs like that. Um, that does not mean that if the um, other party wins that those programs are going to go away. There is significant concern, both from a budget perspective and from a um, patient access perspective, that you know the current models that we have for the way we price drugs, the way not just to the patient but ultimately across the value chain, needs to be addressed and needs to be fixed. Industry agrees, um, the patient community agrees, the Government agrees. We all agree it has to get fixed. What we haven't agreed on is how to fix it. And so what you're going to see is this continual churning, whether we have a President Trump or a President Biden in 2021. Um, there's going to be this continual churning in the industry over the next couple of years um, because nothing moves quickly in Washington. 
um, that is going to, you know, create some concern in the markets and is already creating concern in the venture capital community. Because if you don't know what the reimbursements are going to be on these innovative products that can take 5, 10, 15 years to develop, it really changes the risk parameters as you start to analyze that. So um, I, I strongly encourage you to, to really start to build up relationships um, with your elected leaders, whether you are here in Arizona or you're visiting uh, with us from another state, it is critically important that you start to build those relationships, that you invite them to come see your company, that you, um, if you're going to, to um, Washington, D.C. or Maryland for regulatory meetings, that you, start, you make an appointment, you schedule a time, and you go in and you see them and you bring them up to date on the amazing work that you're doing. Um, if you're already in town, it really makes sense. And with, if you're Arizona companies, you can reach out to me and I will help you with our delegation. If you're from Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, California, the other um, states that are joining us on this call today, um, you know, we will be more than happy if you're not already integrated and working with your local life science association, um, you know, they will help you make those appointments. And um, because they want us to you know, get our companies in front of them. Also, when you're at home, your district offices for your congressional and Senate um, offices are really important to you know, bring them up to date. It's really nice to go to them and say, hey, I just wanna update you on something as opposed to going in with an ask. Everybody goes to them with an ask. Just giving them a feel good story that they can share can have a huge impact. So build those relationships now. Because I'm telling you, in 2021 and 2022, no matter who is sitting in the living in the White House, it is going to be critically important that we all are part of these conversations because the decisions that they make relative to pricing of drugs and will it ultimately also impact diagnostics. It's going to impact medical devices. It is going to change the paradigm of how things get reimbursed. When we change the paradigm of how things get reimbursed, we will change the paradigm of how investors invest. And so it's very, very important that everyone start building relationships, if you have not already, so that we can um, you know, actively engage in those discussions. And you know, once we know who's who in the zoo, we're more than happy to help with that. Um, in addition, AZ Bio's Government Affairs um, Committee meets every uh, month virtually. And um, at that time, I provide you with an update and opportunities where you can, can also engage. The other thing is, um, and AZ Bio does not endorse candidates, um, but we do strongly encourage you to vote because every vote is going to matter this election, no matter who you support. So please vote, encourage your employees to vote, include, encourage your friends and neighbors to vote. Voting will be essential during um, the 2020 elections, probably more than we've seen in recent years. Okay, so we are coming up to the end of our hour. I'm thrilled to see that so many of you were able to figure out how to hop on this call. I apologize for the technical difficulty at the beginning. And um, I encourage you to continue to engage um, with each other, with the people in the Arizona Bioscience Week platform, um, and to attend as many of the sessions as you possibly can this week. And as I shared earlier, we will record, get recordings out on those that you were not able to miss because you were doing other important, make because you were doing other important work. So with that, if I don't see any raised hands or any more comments in the chat, um, thank you, have a wonderful week. And don't forget, um, the Drug Discovery and Development Conference is just starting. You can access the link through your app um, and they have some phenomenal speakers today. So please do take advantage of that. Have a great day. Bye everybody.